So I'm going to talk about some inverse problems uh, between quotes because I don't know if this is what you mean with inverse problems. But so these inverse problems come from signal processing, like signal denoising, compress sensing, phase retrieval. And I'm going to talk about one deep learning approach that has to do with uh, generative models and generative adversarial networks that Jitendra talked yesterday. And, um, and I'm going to explain some mathematical ideas towards explaining why these methods are successful, like some mathematical directions for explaining a theory for this kind of success. So the classical signal processing uh, idea is to uh, do signal processing by exploiting the structure of the signal that one has. So for, for instance, in the, in the 90s, um, Ingrid Dovechis and her collaborators realized that natural images are sparse in some specific bases, the wavelet bases. And, and then in, in the two, early 2000s, that was exploited uh, to, to allow reconstruction of signals or images with uh, very few measurements. So if you have seen compressing before, this is the classical uh, image where you have a signal X that is sparse, so a very few non-zero entries, and then you compress it by multiplying it by a random matrix, and then you have this compressed vector, and you, of course, just compressing by multiplying by a short fat matrix is not something that you can invert, but if you have the uh, sparsity assumption in your vector, you can actually solve this inverse problem by um, uh, putting the assumption that your vector is sparse. Like you say, the sparsity level of your vector is smaller than some s, and the L1, the norm of your vector is smaller than some s, and then you minimize the discrepancy to your observed data. So that's a very classical thing from early 2000s. And, and then the other famous uh, figure that you might have seen before, I think this Um, the, the, the classic figure that you, have, that you may have seen before is like you have this sparse image and then you look at uh, the Fourier space and you sample from the specific points that come from these lines in Fourier space and if you do like a L2 minimization then, then you, your reconstruction will have some artifacts because you are undersampling your, your image but if you, do, if, you, if you put this sparsity prior then, then you can uh, solve this problem very, very well. And this, uh, this uh, there's a lot of theory and very classical. Uh, so, I don't know. Okay, so the current trend right now, we have seen neural networks and, and they're very successful. We've seen that they're successful at four things yesterday. Uh, it was uh, uh, image classification, uh, speech recognition, uh, playing games, that's, that's the goal, the very famous uh, Google uh, breakthrough, and yeah, I don't remember, but, uh, but also for signal processing, the idea is uh, instead of just uh, knowing what the structure of your signal is, just you learn what the structure is and then you exploit it. So use deep learning for learning the structure of your data. And, let's see. and uh, maybe this is a a uh, reasonable claim to say that generative models are the new sparsity for this, for this field. Uh, so what is a generative model? Let's say one classic, uh, what we, you mentioned it yesterday, uh, classic generative model that people use for their data or like for the noise or to see what's going on uh, is the mixture of Gaussians. This is a simple generative model. But now we're going to do a much more complicated generative model that is going to be aiming to uh, learn the distribution of your actual data. That's the generative model. So we're going to say that my generative model is going to be a function g that will depend on a set of parameters in Rd, and it's going to take some element in a small dimension and give me something in a much larger dimension that is going to behave like my data. So if I have uh, 
like ideally, this is, a, is going to be a low parametrization of the distribution of the target data, where if you have a probability density here and you apply this g theta of that probability density, you get the probability density of the target data. How can you find that? Can you find that? We don't know. Mathematically, there's not any proof or idea that you can do it. But uh, in practice, people have produced things like this, and they have been successful for their applications. And um, so then you can produce elements, like random elements from your data, by just like you, you take a random Gaussian in a small dimension, you apply your magic G function to it, and, and then you, the, the, fun, the data that you obtain looks like a, a data from your data set. And, um, and how can you do this? Well, people do it by using autoencoders, generally other silent networks, and we saw yesterday implicit MLE that uh, could produce a generative model of this form, maybe. And there are also other techniques that people use as priors coming from neural networks that do not require any training. And that just say the architecture of my network functions as a prior and they do that for signal processing. And the example that we saw yesterday that is very, very impressive, uh, they, they had this, uh, they, they trained a G function that produces, given a random, uh, so actually this is from yesterday and I, I went to his uh, paper and I just put this image because I really liked it. So they, they say, they take a random uh, Gaussian, they apply the function that they trained and they obtain these phases. And then this is just an interpolation between other phases. So that's really cool. I don't know how, how, how many resources or what kind of resources do you need to actually produce something like this. I must say that I, I'm allowed to show my next slide because I am a mathematician. And I'm sorry if, I, if it's embarrassing, but let's, let's do it. Uh, I'm going to do an example with MNIST, the 100 digits, because that's what I can do. And uh, so we have uh, these, these numbers. And so, uh, so I'm going to do something terrible. I'm going to add a lot of noise. Like if you, if you look at it, OK, if you have the number here, you know what number is hidden. But the signal to, uh, to noise is so low that you may not be able to guess what number is below. I don't know. Um, and so this comparison is going to be very, very unfair because I'm going to use a very, very strong prior here. But I'm going to compare with what, how can I do the noising of this image by doing shrink, shrink in the wavelet domain. And maybe there is a better way to implement this. I, the way I implemented it, I got these numbers, which you can actually see what the numbers are. But the noise is so high that you can actually like, get some patterns from the noise that disturb the number. And then I, uh, I implemented stands, uh, mi uh, minimization of the total variation norm. And I got something that is much better, actually. In, you can see the numbers, but maybe a, a better implementation would be better. But the signal to noise is so, so low that it's possible that you, that you cannot do much better than this. Uh, but then what I'm going to do is I'm going to train a generative adversarial uh, model, a generative adversarial network. And I'm going to produce that as a prior for my data. So the way I'm going to denoise is I'm going to find the nearest point to this noisy image in the image of my, of my GAN, of my generator. Does that, does that make sense? And when I did this, actually, it, you find the right number, but it doesn't look like what it should, because it's like it realizes that the space has like this structure with these different clusters. And and this is what it should be, but it's not the actual, the numbers don't look the same. So that's, that's something that you can do if you have like, this kind of structure and you want to use some prior of this form. So how I implemented this, not the optimal way. I just just say, like, OK, I'm going to take a feedforward neural network. Uh, that's going to be like a composition of linear linear step with like nonlinearity, and I'm going to train on the, on the linear uh, steps. 
uh, like four layers. And then I'm going to train a discriminator that decides whether an image, is, uh, an image of a digit is real or fake. And then I'm going to train a generator, I mean, at the same time, one against the other one that is going to produce images that are going to try to fool the discriminator into saying that this is a, a, a real image. And I train one against the other one. And at the end, uh, when I converge, I say that I converge when my generator could fool the discriminator half of the time. I mean, this is a very classical thing. This is a very classical idea. Just like I implemented it myself, and it worked. But I also have observed that uh, the mold collapse problem, I observed it. And I don't know what I did, but at the end, I could fix it. But yes, this is a real issue. And it's a, yeah, it's a very trial and error kind of problem. So other techniques like the ones that we saw yesterday could be very successful at that. No, I did all at, all at the same time. But that's also something that you could, you could do, yeah. Like if you know what cla how many classes you have, you could train it separately, and, and that should be useful, yeah. Uh, so let's go to the math. OK, so, um, so the, <coughs> They use uh, as, uh, of generative other science networks as priors in this kind of field in, com in this area of signal processing and co-presencing. Uh, I, I was very surprised by, by this result from 2017. It was in ICML. Uh, so it's uh, Eric Price and Alex Imakis from UT Austin, so very close. And they, they actually show that they can train a generative model uh, with uh, activation function ReLU. And they consider a random matrix as a measurement, like you do usually in compressing. And for the compressing problem, they say Y is my signal. It's going to be the matrix A, but it's compressed. Like, OK, sorry. X, X star is my signal. I'm going to compress it by multiplying by this short fat random matrix A. And I'm going to add some noise. And this is going to be my measurement. And, and now I'm going to train a generative model for my data. And I'm going to solve the comprehensive problem as before. But instead of having the sparsity assumption, I'm going to have the assumption that my, uh, my x, or my z here, is, is going to be in the image of this generative model that I trained. And and then you solve this using gradient descent because this, this is not convex, so you cannot do like the interesting like compressing kind of algorithms. Uh, so, so, and experimentally, what they found is that they require ten times fewer measurements than classic compressing to solve this problem. So that's very impressive. And they proved. I don't know what's wrong. Yes. And they proved that um, the, all the solutions that of this minimization problem will satisfy uh, that they are approximately close to the planted solution. So of course, they don't know what z is going to be, because the generative model may not be injective. But they know that g of their minimizer is going to be close to the planted signal. But so. They, they, they show that the solution of this optimization problem is actually what they want, but you don't know if you can solve that problem. And because if, if, if you do gradient descent on, on this, on this, the, this, in this objective, you may not converge. So they, they may be lo local minima or critical points that you don't like. And then there is this work by uh, Paul Hand and Vlad Voroninsky that analyze this framework, and they, they say that, well, we don't know that for, if you're, for your generative model, uh, that is the composition of these random, uh, of these uh, linear steps with activation functions, ReLU, that, that you train uh, the optimization problem of, the, of compressing is going to be easy. But what they can say is that if the, if, if the generative model was random, 
then the problem is easy. In the sense that if you have that if each of the linear steps of your neural network where each of the uh, linear maps of your neural network was random, random Gaussian of this form, then all the uh, critical points are close to the planted solution or minus the planted solution. So, so this says that for and, and this this theorem uses very like uses that the activation function is really like is that's very important. Mm. Okay. So we don't know if the actual optimization problem is easy or hard, but we know that a random one is is easy. That's I think that's interesting. And. Any questions until now? Yes. So for the result of the handed or this is a position of the number of samples. Yes, yes, they so yes. Yeah, they, they have that, yeah. I, I just wanted to make it. Hmm? You said yes, but I don't know if they get to. So uh, so you need you need a, a condition uh, of the number of samples in order to, to have that. So this uh, yeah, you, you need to have a condition how many samples you have, and also there's a condition on like how, how, long, how, how large are the layers. So I'm going to talk about my work now uh, that is motivated by the work of Paul Hand and Vlad Bereninsky. And it's a slightly different framework than, than they do. We don't consider random neural networks, uh, uh, and we don't consider comprehensive. We consider a simple a simpler problem that is the image denoising that I showed you the experiment before. And we, we replace the, the random assumption with saying that the map is spherically uniform. Uh, let's, I'm going to show you what I mean with that. And I'm not going to be tailored to a specific activation function as they were uh, tailored to RILU. I'm going to uh, say, I'm going to show what of the properties of the activation functions are going to be useful for my framework. So it's kind of analyzing in a different, in a different direction. And the theory leverages the spherical harmonics. So, so the, the sun layer generating model is going to be, so one layer of a sun layer uh, is going to be a function that takes a vector in the sphere and produces a function L2 of the sphere that is going to be the composition of the activation function with the inner product of my vector from the sphere with something else in the sphere. So, so this is a function of y that, uh, so this ln of x evaluated in y is going to be rho of x with y. Okay. So, if we, so here we are kind of considering uh, like, a, con, like all possible, if you want all possible matrices, like if, 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 you, if you had a matrix A, like the application of a, a specific matrix A, what you're doing is you're taking the rows of A and plugging them there. So selecting a matrix is just evaluating this function in the, in the rows of the matrix. Does that make sense? So this is like a, all possible neural networks in some way. So this is actually this is a particular case of uh, the continuous neural networks that have been studied. And, and then you can compose these, uh, these layers. Well, you cannot, but you can make some, some tricks to compose these layers by, for example, if the image is finite dimensional, then you can project to the right uh, subspace, subspace of L2 and then compose them. Or you can do some projection here and then compose it. But if you want to compose these layers in, in the way they are, then you may want to have that the image of this map is finite dimensional. And that <laughs> happens if and only if the activation function is a polynomial. Okay. So. I'm going to show a theorem for the denoising case. I, 
I'm missing one slide. Yes, let's, I'm gonna show you this first, sorry. Uh, so what is, what is gonna be to do the noising here? Uh, so I'm gonna say that I have a function L2, and that's my ground truth, is L of some X sharp. Uh, that's my ground truth, and then I'm gonna say my, my noisy measurement is gonna be ln of x, x sharp plus some noise, and uh, the noising is gonna be, well, I'm gonna do the noising by minimizing uh, in x, ln of x minus my measurement, right? And then my, my theorem is gonna say, it says something kind of weird, uh, that let's say that my activation function is rho, and I can decompose, rho is a function from R to R, and I can decompose rho in many ways. I'm gonna choose to decompose it in a specific basis, that is gonna be the Gegenbauer polynomials. I'm gonna show you where that comes from later, but for now it's a mystery. You have rho uh, decomposed in these Gegenbauer polynomials, and then I'm gonna do a weird transformation of rho and obtain a function g. And that function g is gonna be the squaring of the coefficients of rho in the composition of the Gegenbauer polynomials, and just that. So I just take rho, square the, co the, the composing Gegenbauer polynomials, square the coefficients, and obtain g. And I'm gonna, and, and the theorem says that all the critical points are close to the planted truth provided that the derivative of this, uh, of this uh, g function that I obtained by squaring the coefficients is, uh, is far from zero. It's, uh, it's greater than zero everywhere. So actually, the amount of noise that I will be able to handle is gonna be depending on the minimum value of this derivative. So that's, that's kind of weird, but so then this would tell me what, well, if I wanna do the noising with this uh, generative model, then, then it makes sense to consider uh, activation function so that this minimum of the derivative is large. And this looks um, weird, but actually, if you, if you look at the spherical harmonics, the, the reason why this happens is, is quite simple and it's just because if we decompose our L in the spherical harmonics, then when you take the inner product, okay, so you decompose here L in this spherical harmonics, and the inner product of L n of x and L n of x sharp uh, by the reproducing property is just the squaring of the coefficients on this uh, devaluation of the spherical harmonics in x and x sharp, and then the property, the, the solar property says that actually the, the spherical harmonics, uh, the evaluation in this pair of points only depends on the inner product on this uh, pair of points, and actually the value is the Gegenbauer, the Gegenbauer polynomial in the inner product of these two things. So this is where the squaring of the coefficients of the, of the, uh, of the spherical harmonics come from. And then you can write the conditions for the optimality and you can actually uh, do something clever to see how it would behave with respect to the noise. And, and then what you can do is, given the noise, you can, um, you can decompose it in a specific basis of your spherical harmonics that, that you choose the evaluation of your spherical harmonics in a specific points of the sphere that form a spherical 2K design, and then with that property, you can see that you, that you can do the computations in a much, much easier way, just, just with using the, the frame property. Okay, so I'm gonna show you some experiments with this. Uh, I don't know why this is. Uh, so, so here, I don't know if you can see, I, I have three activation functions that I got from Wikipedia that people seem to use. One is ILU, another one is RILU, and another one is SOFT PLUS. And I consider my, a Gegenbauer approximation of my, 
of my function up to like 30 coefficients. So of course, this one, since this is not differentiable, the approximation is not that good. Um, and then I consider the function g, and then I look at the derivative. And the derivative of g, uh, so the, the smallest value that it takes for ELU is like 1.5, for ReLU is like 0 0.25, and for soft plus is like 0 0.46. So one would expect that at, for this, the noising task, ReLU is not as good as <coughs> soft plus, and then it will be ELU the, the better, the better of these three. And then when I, and then I'm going to do an experiment to, to see how this behaves in this specific setting. And the experiment is going to be, it's not going to be with a functional two, but it's going to be with like a linear function with like 100, like from, from dimension 10 to dimension 100. So maybe an approximation of that. And I take y to be uh, one layer of this, of this neural network, and that uh, for a random matrix of this form. And I'm going to the, the, solve the denoising problem for a planted x star, uh, for a planted x sharp. And x star is going to be what I get with gradient descent. And I'm going to measure how far my x, my, the solution is from the planted solution and how far the actual value of the, of the generative model is at each of these, the, the planted solution and the, and, and, and the solution that I obtained. And actually seems to be consistent with what I got in the previous slide. So here we saw really was the worst, then was soft plus, and then it was ELU, and here so ReLU is the one that has more noise when you do this denoising step. And then so plus, and then. So ELU seems to converge much faster than so plus and this. This So my, my bound is, is a uniform bound. So it's a bound on the, using the norm of the noise. I don't have an, uh, an assumption on the noise is random, but I guess that the analysis, if you have more assumptions on the noise, you can be, do a better analysis than I did. Yeah. And, um, and then you can extend this, this, this star layer model to uh, to a finite setting or a learning setting by choosing uh, a finite su uh, dimensional subset of, of L2 and then projecting whatever you obtain with the sun layer to, to that subset and then uh, fit the, these vectors that uh, lear learn, I mean, learn the, the Vs that fit the data. Mm -hmm. And also I'm considering a semi-definite programming relaxation of this model to do some analysis of, of, of this, but I, I don't have it yet. And so I'm going to summarize what I just talked today. I said that uh, generative models are powerful priors for scenic processing. I think that I didn't demonstrate that myself, but it seems to be something that uh, is common knowledge right now. Uh, I show. Uh, a specific model, some layer, a continuous model for neural networks, and how the spherical harmonics explain what properties of the activation functions are useful for the noising using this model. And hopefully, that will tell you more about the activation functions because it seems like uh, there a there's a lot of in designing how, what activation functions to use, and sometimes there's not some theory that explains what activation functions are, like what properties of the activation functions are desirable. And this is like one specific, like small example of how to analyze these things. Maybe it would be useful in a more general setting. And uh, another problems that I'm thinking about, apart from the semi-definite programming relaxation, is analyzing this in this finite setting, in the learning setting, and uh, see what classification functions you can, you can express as the as this in this specific framework as a composition of these sun layers.